Okay, let's get started. Hello and welcome to the Open Research Institute office hours, including FPGA stand-up meeting, if any, uh, for, for this week. We'll be doing just the one session today, not trying to do it again at, at 2 p.m. Pacific time. Um, just not convenient for everybody this, this week. We will be talking about progress, um, roadblocks, uh, and then I'll throw the forum open for any kind of uh, other discussion, office hours, chit chat and see what everybody has to say. Uh, let's uh, go ahead and get started. James, uh, you have a report from the Remote Lab South. Uh, that's right. We're beginning work on, well, not just beginning, we are working on the temporary FPGA deployment over this month. And then after that's done, we've completed a few of our other infrastructure pro uh, projects that we have around the area. We'll be focusing more fully our efforts on the permanent FPGA installation. And so, yeah, excited for that. Okay, very good. A uh, temporary FPGA installation. Could you describe that very briefly for everybody? Uh, yes, it's going to be one of the, it, it's fairly basic. It's very similar to what you have over in Remote Lab West, where we're going to be setting up some of the basic project boards. So that way people can be doing some of their efforts here at Remote Lab South. Uh, that we're not going to have the like biggest and most major machines available until the permanent installation is completed. Okay, very good. Look forward to that. That'll be fun. There should be some interesting twists and turns in that procedure, if my experience is any indication. Um, I have a bit of a report from Remote Lab West, um, a micro success story, if you will. Um, I was working this week on uh, Opulent Voice. The goal, instant goal, was to replace the GNU radio flow graph on the transmit side of my test bed where I am able to run some uh, opulent voice over the air by transmitting from a file through the GNU radio flow graph and an SDR, usually a, a Pluto or, or a Blade RF or something of that nature, and then over a short coax for simulating the airways to the receiver, which is uh, real hardware and not real hard, not final hardware, obviously, but hardware and some uh, C++ test code uh, that simulates what we would put into an actual uplink receiver. And my goal for the day was to get rid of any radio out of that so that one less variable, one less uh, simulation in the process. And so I started writing some code for the Pluto to transmit. Uh, starting with the example flow graph that that analog devices provides for for transmitting on the Pluto, uh, I was working in my lab here, which you see behind me, and uh, using the Pluto that we had, been, had tested with in the remote lab, uh, and using the spectrum analyzer that's Michelle's that lives here, and we uh, noticed. Uh, very soon after I got transmitting started that every time the transmitter turned on, there was a burst of unexplained noise uh, in the channel and beyond the boundaries of the channel. Uh, and this caught my attention and seemed like something I needed to track down and get fixed before uh, very much else could happen. That kind of extra uh, transmitted energy is, is going to be unacceptable over the air. So I, I spent some time trying to characterize it here in this lab and realized that with the old technology spectrum analyzer that we have here, it's an, an analog spectrum analyzer from, I don't know how many decades ago, not ancient, but not state of the art either. I was going to have a hard time characterizing exactly what was going on with this noise. So I picked up the transmitter, which was by this time is in a Raspberry Pi and a Pluto, so just a handful of hardware, literally and walked across to the remote lab. Um, this is something that most remote users do not have the luxury of doing, but I, since I host the remote lab here in the house, I can uh, 
I can do that easily. And I set up that transmit side of that test bench there in the remote lab and hooked up to our nice Regal spectrum analyzer that we have in the remote lab, which is able to capture in real time a combination water flow and uh, waterfall and uh, panorama adapter. What uh, some people on ham radio call a panafall display. And I was able to see that something very complicated was happening at, at the beginning of each transmission. Not, I expected it to be just white noise or something like that, or maybe a, a rapid pull in of the frequency uh, across the spectrum or something like that. But it, that's not what it was. It was something interesting happening, uh, very consistent, and it looked almost deliberate. Um, I had no idea what would cause that. Uh, but I wanted to characterize it as much as possible in hopes of finding a clue uh, that would help me figure out what to change in the uh, initialization of the transmit process that would make this burst of noise go away. I used the uh, remote viewing video feature or the remote lab. Uh, I was able to uh, come back here to, to my lab where I have nice screens and a, a comfy chair and room to think <laughs> as opposed to the remote lab which is a little bit crowded not intended to be a, a workspace really and I was, I was able to watch the spectrum analyzer on my screen here while I while I tried different things and worked on it and then when I found something that I wanted to document I was able to use a remote screen capture capability that I, that I built a little python script that runs on any of the machines in the remote lab that can capture um or on the remote lab LAN for that matter, although it's more efficient to do it on a local machine to capture the screen off the spectrum analyzer and, and uh, retain a, a record of what was seen for later comparison or for documentation purposes. And I learned, as I said, that there was a lot of structure to the uh, to the burst, but I, I couldn't out what was causing it. It didn't make any sense to me at all. And so at the end of the day, rolled around and so i i wrote up what i had seen this is our open process technique that we rely on here at open research institute i wrote it down a few paragraphs on slack and I posted the screenshots that i had taken over the uh, over the remote lab screenshot facility and pretty quickly i got an offer of help from jay uh, k1pqk who offered to, uh, to run some similar tests at his lab where he has spectrum analyzer and Pluto and uh, confirmed that it wasn't just my own hardware. He suggested that if I had another Pluto, I should try it, which was a good suggestion. Um, but at the time I was asleep. So <laughs> the next morning I woke up and I found uh, the solution which had just miraculously appeared thanks to Everest, uh, F50EO. Um, he knew what I was seeing where I did not. And it turned out to be a normal behavior of the Pluto. It's a self-calibration procedure that it runs by default every time you start a transmit on a new frequency, where new means not just a little bit off, but by some substantial step off. And because of the defaults and the fact that I'm using a non-default transmit frequency uh, in the handband, it was doing it every time. So he also told me what I had to do to turn it off. Uh, which was extremely helpful. <laughs> and he helped me find the way to do that through the IIO call, whereas the documentation uh, does it through the SysBus uh, file system. And it worked. So this problem that I would have struggled with for an unlimited amount of time, uh, not having any clue that there was an intentional behavior like this, uh, was solved overnight. Uh, with the help of the open process and having the right expert on the channel, Everest in this case. So thank you, Everest. And that's uh, my success story for uh, for open process for this week. Um, other Lab West uh, report is everything is situation normal. It, everything is working. Uh, the spectrum analyzer is currently connected to the Pluto from time to time because of my opulent voice tests but is available as usual for other test people need to run. So that concludes, I think, the, uh, the FPGA part of this standup. 
unless uh, unless you have something else for the uh, for the floor, James. Uh, nothing new here other than that. Okay, very good. I believe that concludes then the, the formal part of this meeting, such as it is. Um, oh, by the way, I should, should mention that anybody who wants to see these screenshots I'm talking about should go on Slack and look in the Opulent Voice channel uh, posted over the last couple of days. You'll see, uh, see those screenshots and the discussion and uh, some lengthy threads where uh, Everest continues to add even more help. And uh, look for some additional progress on that front uh, in the near future. So we will transition into an informal office hours mode. We don't have a large turnout today uh, live, but hopefully people uh, watching the video will will benefit from my little story there and the other report from James. Uh, Sasha, do you have anything to uh, to contribute to the uh, to the open hours part? No, no. Um, I was just tuning in to listen. Okay, very good. Welcome. Um, anything for office hours, James, or are we out of things to talk about? I think I'm covered here. Okay, very good. Uh, with my story, we managed to stretch it out to a, a reason for people to show up and have not gotten a lot of turnout this morning because people have other things going on. Yeah. Uh, let me think for a second if I have anything else to talk about. Um, Michelle is at a conference learning about information theory and uh, having a good time, I hope. Uh, she'll come back with her brain full of a new information theory ideas and uh, hopefully some good stories. And maybe some contacts and uh, networking opportunities for, for ORI. looking at my lists. I do not see anything. So I'm going to call it. Uh, thank you both for your participation this morning. And thank you out there in the Open Research Institute community for listening to our weekly meeting.